passage. Now, have you ever seen a little child oh, open that big box of little goodies? That's what the Word of God is. You know, it's better. It's, it's, it's silver tried uh, seven times in a furnace of earth. It's more precious than gold. It's better than the honey in the honeycomb. You ever seen a child open up a box and say, oh, junky toys, man, I already got toys. Man, you give him a, a box of toys, he'll open that up, and he'll say, where's the next box? And you say, you greedy thing. <laughs> Been teaching you fruit of the Spirit now. Cut all that nonsense out. That's just, you know, that's, that should be what's just in a child. Well, where's the next fun thing now? That's how we're supposed to be in the Word. Well, now we've learned that. Praise God. Lord, what's next for us? Hey, you know, I kind of hear you people whenever I'm in the other room in there, and you don't seem like you ever get stale on me out here. Like, oh, no, we're at church again here. At church, that's the highlight of our whole week. <laughs> Going to work, that's a boring thing. You got to go to that to get through it so you can get here. Well, <laughs> if you don't work, you don't eat. So I would recommend that you work out there, but... That's just to pay bills so you can come to church so you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. We can't grow stale. People get bored with the word after a while. We know. See, we're not talking about something we don't know anything about. We know from 10 years of our own experience what it's all about when you just stay with the word, when that's what you emphasize. And people think, now, if you emphasize that, then I guess it's going to probably be the letter, not the spirit. And they'll quote you 2 Corinthians 3. Now, the letter kills, the spirit gives life. And Well, I just ask them, come over and visit and check us out. See if we got life or not. I believe we got life around here. We're pretty happy. What do I have to do? Do a dance up here to prove that we're all happy? I'm happy. You're happy? Are you happy tonight? I'm happy. We're all happy then. Well, we're happy over is the word of God. It's that word of God is going to be our bread and feed us and do the miracles and heal us and deliver our children when labor is a little long and hard. And it's going to be our source of deliverance in all regards. It's going to set us free. We're not into the letter. We're into the letter and the spirit. And when you have the letter and the spirit, then, then you won't become uh, off balance in one direction or the other. Well, I'm saying something about time. Doesn't it have a way of dulling people's appreciation unless you stay fresh in your day-to-day -day relationship with Jesus? You stay fresh in that? I hate to say life's a bang, but because Jesus said, you know, in the world you're going to have tribulation, but he went on to say in John 16, 33, be of good cheer, I've overcome this world. We don't get bogged down in all the tribulations. We face the facts of reality. You're going to have tribulation in the world. But he said, rejoice. I've overcome it. I've overcome it. Hallelujah. We're, we're blessed because we know he's overcome it. And if he can overcome it, we can overcome it as well. Amen. Whatever he did, he said, I've left you an example that you should follow in my steps. We're going to follow in his steps. 1 John 5, we overcome the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 4, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So what happens now when the people get dissatisfied with the word, they grow bored, then the minister has this temptation presented him to give them what they want. That's where things become really dangerous. The minister has this temptation and he either successfully resists it or he succumbs to it. He has a temptation now before him. We're always presented with choices. He has a choice before him. I'm going to bow to that temptation and give them what they want, which isn't the word, not another teaching from the word. Or he can say, you know what? They're tired of the word, and I've been preaching good messages out of John. Let's see, I'm going to find First Chronicles. I'm going to give him a word out of First Chronicles chapter 1. You know, my practice has been, if you ever sense anybody backing off, just bear down a little harder. Amen. You'll either make a true disciple out of them, or, or they'll go ahead and leave, and they're going to leave sooner or later anyway. Might as well make it sooner, not later. There'll be more judgment the longer they stay there, because Paul said in Acts 13, you're going to be judged by the word that you hear. Jesus said, I'm not going to judge you. There's a word that in the last day will judge you. And that's this word that we've all been presented with. 
If I ever sense that, I just bear down a little harder. And you know what hasn't hurt any of you people, has it? May, it may have uh, hit you on the head, but we read about that in a recent teaching over in the book of Psalms. Let the righteous smite me. And it's gladness to me. It's oil on my head. He won't break my head. Let the righteous smite me. He won't break my head. What do we have to fear but... What, somebody said fear itself? Well, I wouldn't even fear that. What I'd fear is complacency in the Christian life. Once you hit into that old rut of apathy and uh, dissatisfaction, my, my, I guess you have to read Revelation then. 2-4, Jesus said, I've got something against you. You're doing fairly well. You, 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 you cannot bear th uh, that which is evil. You've tried those who've said they are apostles and are not, and you found them to be liars, but I've got something against you that you've left your first love. The temptation is to give them what they want. What's that? Turn some stones into bread. Multiply some food. Give them a sign. Work a miracle. Teach an inspirational message. Oh, no. You see, those things are fun to people. The temptation is to turn some stones into bread. I think that was one of our Lord's temptations. To do a carnal sign to satisfy carnal desires and appetites. Anytime someone grows dissatisfied with the word, they're manifesting a carnal tendency there. What are you supposed to do? Meet their carnal tendency with your own carnality? You, you defeat the flesh with the spirit. You don't meet the flesh with the flesh. Jesus said, man, and by the way, what did Jesus say in Matthew 4, 4? Whenever he had that temptation of turning stones into bread, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? We're back to the word, aren't we? Amen. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. That's a verse we've locked in on over these years. You live by every word. That's every word in this book here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. It is really, all scripture is profitable for us. For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, and so forth. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he's quoting that from back in the book of, well, the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy. They had to listen to all those Levitical laws and stipulations, and that was bread for them. They had some real manna, you know, I mean some physical manna, but, uh, you know, they got tired of that after a while. Oh, they just began to loathe that and said, won't you give us some meat? And God gave them some quails until it ran out their ears and nostrils. That's right. We ought to be thankful. For, I mean, what if you got fed supernaturally every morning? Say, I would never grow tired of that. Israel did. What if I had a strong anointed word of faith and overcomers? I'd never, I would not. Many people have said that. Where are they today? Man, all they do is teach around there. So what's new? I thought that's what church was all about. If you think church is about something else, you've been looking around you in the world watching other churches too much. You had not been in this book that tells you what the church is supposed to be like. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Paul's rebuking the Hebrew Christians in Hebrews 5 and verse 12. He said, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. Again, he's saying, you should know the word because you've been taught the word and you should abide in it and get deep in the word. It always goes back to this word. The temptation for the minister is to work a sign, do something to satisfy the people's carnal desires. Let me give you a good example. Israel, Moses in the desert. Oh, can I say the phrase, man alive? Moses was tempted so many times with Israel, tempted and tempted and tempted with those stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears people. Oh, would God we had died in Egypt. What would you rather be, a free man in the desert or a slave in a land of plenty? Somebody's got their head screwed on backwards. I'd rather be the Lord's free man out in the desert. Yeah. Then the devil's captive oh, when I can get some leeks and garlics and onions and fish. They, they remembered all those flesh pots back in Egypt. Oh, Moses, we're thirsty out here now. You say, well, Moses did give them some. Well, that's right, because God wanted to bring those people along. But what would have happened if the people would have been thirsty and as a group they just got together or, you know, at least the leaders got together and said, praise God, our God's faithful. We don't have to go ask Moses for something and complain and criticize. 
Let's just ask the Lord to do a miracle for us. I mean, Moses asked him, and he did. Surely if the people would have gone in childlike faith, said, God Almighty, you brought us out by an outstretched arm of divine power from Egypt. Now we're, all we're asking for is a drink of water. You took us right through the Red Sea and made it congeal like a giant aquarium on both sides. We walked over on dry land. The Egyptians are saying to do so, the writer of Hebrews 11 said, were drowned, they perished. God slew them in the depth of the Red Sea. All we're asking for is a drink of water. God would have given them that. But in their complaints and criticisms and we've got to hear Leviticus and we've got to hear the book of the law read, you know, year by year here. In their complaints and criticisms, they manifested what? An evil heart of unbelief, a carnal desire. They were very carnal people. Wherever we back off from the Word, back off from wanting to go deeper in this Word, when we grow weary in the well-doing of the Word, when we cease to desire to be a workman in the Word, 2 Timothy 2.15, we're manifesting the same low level of spirituality, which is no spirituality, it's carnality. And I'm saying there the minister is tempted to give the people what, he, what they want. So he either listens to the people's carnal desires, you can pick up on it, if you're a minister and you've got any discernment at all, you can pick up on people's carnal desires. If you've got a whole group that's falling out there, it becomes carnal. If people don't desire the word anymore, they're not really genuinely enthused like they were when they first got saved. Man, I remember when I first got saved, and it hasn't changed for me, by the way, friends. That's not boasting. That's just the way that it is, and thank God that it is. I don't know what I'd do if it ever changed. I don't plan on it changing. When I first got saved, you just could hardly wait, you know, to get home from school or work or whatever and just get to open your Bible again. Man, John 9, John 4, John, uh, Matthew, Isaiah, you just could hardly wait to get home and open your Bible because there were so many things there that you'd never read before. Man, you'd get so excited, you'd, you know, you'd make the mistake of going and telling somebody about it. <laughs> and off your head would come and... So you'd have to go through that. But that's a, that was a real blessing, though. Where are people now? Where are people now? A lot of people don't appreciate what we have, friends. They don't appreciate what they had at one time. If you appreciate it, you're going to keep it. You're going to stay with it. You see, what happens with the minister is fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of loss sets in. If he can detect, if the people are growing dissatisfied over the word, and I think what happens is people get dissatisfied when certain other things happen in the ministry. We'll talk about that, uh, Lord willing, before we're through here. Other things happen, and people start growing dissatisfied. Let me say this. I've never detected any of you people growing dissatisfied with the word. But people do grow dissatisfied. Ministers can detect that. Now they've got the choice following the people's desires or following the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just say, bear down. Just bear down. You'll purge the body. You'll pur Well, I may lose some numbers. So what? You're not above the Lord. He lost numbers in John 6. You're not above him. That's nothing to be embarrassed about or ashamed because you lost people out of your church. That's a worldly attitude. The worldly attitude is, well, we got a big church, big numbers, never lost anybody. Well, that's wonderful. Wonder that's a worldly attitude, though. You're not above the Lord. The disciple is not above his master. He will be as his master. Amen. Jesus wasn't embarrassed because he lost some people in John 6. He just really bore down hard on them. And they said, that's a hard... You mean eat your flesh and drink your blood? Why? Well, what is this, cannibalism or something? Of course, it was the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. They, they were not listening with spiritual ears there. And they said, this is a hard saying. And from that time, many went back and walked no more with him. He wasn't ashamed or embarrassed. If you lose people because you're teaching the world, that's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's not something to go boasting about either. It's just, it just happens. That's just going to be an inevitable result. We've lost a person or two over the years, have we not? I think when I first came to this group of people here, uh, we probably had 100 people first service. I showed up, and we grew to 20. <laughs> I counted it growth. There are a lot of people around there, you know, if they want to stay and obey the word, then praise God. 
Would to God the whole United States would convert and receive the end time message. But we grew from 100 to 20. I call that growth. Spiritual, scriptural growth. Because then you're down to people who are committed to the Lord Jesus, who really care about what they're involved in. They've made this the, the central point of their life, and they're not going to back away. And those are you people, plus we've got other people here, of course, but some of you are those people, those 20 back years ago. But see, what I'm saying is the minister, he, he's not dumb either. Hmm, let's see now. People want, uh, want me to work a little number on their head here. You know, do a jig or do something funny that, you know, you haven't ever done before. Make people laugh and they'll come back next time. Or do something for the kiddies or, oh, maybe start up children's church. That'll always get people there. Hey, man, I can get all these kids off my back and actually sit down and whew, take a breath here. I got 74 of these guys like Gad, the troop following behind me here. And if I can ship them off to some other place and, yeah, do a little, do a little uh, denominationalism on our head. Do a denominational number on our head. And people just love, they'll eat that up. Stay with the word, though, they don't like that. Did it one time. Supposed to always like the word of God, but mm, it doesn't taste good anymore. There's no problem with the word, I think it's with our own mouth. So he senses failure, rejection, loss of life, ministry, monies. We don't want to talk about money in church, do we? I mean, money, see, nobody's ever been concerned about money in the overcomers camp, have they? <laughs> I dare say they probably have been. Fear of loss of whatever. I think Jesus said that before we ever get on this path, we're supposed to count the cost. Find out if we've got sufficient once we've started the building that we can finish it. We're supposed to count the cost. But again, there's also, there's a little process involved there. We didn't know what all was involved on day one. It took us time getting into it. So it's not just something you do once and for all as you get into this wall. You more and more count the cost when you see what it's going to cost you. And in the end of Luke 9, Jesus gives us several different illustrations. The last of those was one man who just, well, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first. And Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for my kingdom. Now, I know your typical evangelist or pastor, he says, I'll just take anybody. We don't. No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. He can't trust a man like that because when the going gets rough, he's going to look back. When you look back, you go back. Looking back is the first step to going back. What did, Egypt, what did Israel do? They looked back and saw those flesh pots in Egypt, and that was the first step in going back in their heart. They said whenever they finally got to the land in Numbers uh, chapter 13, end of Numbers 13, and all of chapter 14, we're finally here, we'll send in spies. That, that was Israel's idea, not Moses. Read that in Deuteronomy 1. Moses said, that's okay, it pleased me well. Go ahead and send your spies in. Sent 12 in, two came back, good report. Joshua and Caleb, 10 came back, oh, evil report. Evil report, oh, their sons of Anakim are in there, so there are giants in there, and we are in their sight like grasshoppers. Caleb and Joshua said, yep, that's right, there are giants. So what, our God's well able, they're like bread for us. Their defense has departed from them. That's what faith is all about. You don't look around you at the circumstances. God is faithful, period. That's all there is to it. Caleb and Joshua said, we are well able to overcome them. But no, they, they said, oh, we've got to go back to Egypt. And you know, you don't get all this there. You go over to, what is it, the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, a post-exilic writer, gives us a little insight to what was happening way back there prior to the conquest and organization of Canaan and the establish of, establishment of the Jewish monarchy. Nehemiah's book tells us they actually went so far as to appoint a captain that was going to actually take them back to Egypt. You don't read that in the Pentateuch. You have to get over to Nehemiah and find that. They not only looked back, they had gone so far as to appoint a new leader. It wasn't Moses. He would never go back. You guys go by yourself. I'm staying here. They actually went so far in their desires and their evil uh, plans that they appointed a captain to take them back. Obviously, they didn't make it. God's not going to let them do that. He said, your carcasses are going to fall in the wilderness. You've spoken that in my ears. You've well said, so it will 
take place in your life. Your carcasses will fall in this wilderness, and your children, which you said would be a prey, they will inherit the land. We've got to stay with this word. God's faithful to his word. People are afraid. Ministers are afraid. What, what am I going to lose? The people are, the, you know, they're growing a little bored. They're not satisfied with the word anymore. They, the minister begins to fear failure and rejection then. But be encouraged. Jesus went through, endured victoriously the same type situation. And look at all of the fruit that has come through the Lord Jesus' ministry. All of us are here. We're here because Jesus was faithful. Because Jesus was faithful. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the captain of our salvation. Jesus was faithful because he was faithful. We're here tonight. I'm always reminded, friends, of a story that Dr. Freeman would tell. Just an illustration wasn't a particular story, although it probably happened to him more than once, but it was a story that he would often tell. He would say, bring two ministers to town, put them in buildings side by side, let one of them be a miracle worker, the other one the teacher. You'll find out where the people go. They'll make an exit so fast you want to get out of the way. It'll be like that man that got trampled to death by the, that, back in 2 Kings. You want to get away from the door. They'll, they'll leave that teaching situation so fast you don't want to be in their way. Where would they go? To watch a miracle. Everybody wants to see a sign done, watch some stones be turned into bread. I believe that he even said that he had ministered in a place before and there was another person, we'll just call them an evangelist, who had signs and wonders following. And Brother Freeman had a big, you know, uh, group of people there, just in a foreign place or another outside of where he was from, another city. And uh, crowds were, you know, good, good number until that evangelist came. And they had signs and wonders. People fell out in the spirit under their meetings. Well, isn't that great? So you can go carry home that with you, the falling out in the spirit experience. How, what's that going to do for you, though? It's good if the Lord touches you like that, but... The Bible says, blessed is the one who hears and does the word of God. Remember, Jesus had a woman who got all caught up and came up to him one day and said, oh, blessed is the one that bear thee in the path which thou hast sucked. And Jesus said, what are you talking about, lady? There's no special blessing on that. Yea, rather blessed is he who hears the word of God and does it. Amen. There's where the blessing is, the one who hears the word of God. That's Luke 11, the one who hears the word of God and does it. How can you do falling out in the Spirit? How can you go out that week and practice that? You know, be doers of the Word, not hearers only? How can you go out and do that? Unless you just go practice it at home. <laughs> I guess people probably have even done that. I'm going to practice this. Hey, you know what I read, by the way? This is a little aside, but you know, one of these big healing ministries, husband and wife team, she wears glasses, she's terribly overweight, and she wrote a book on how to lose weight. <laughs> I never did figure that one out. <laughs> Maybe it's her confession what she's going to do eventually. But anyway, she wrote a book on, I won't give you the title, but how to lose weight. She never did that, but they laid hands on somebody and fell out in the spirit and broke their back. <laughs> now they're under, what, a half million dollar lawsuit for breaking somebody's back. I said, praise the Lord. That sounds like what the Lord's going to allow to happen, a lot of these false ministries out there. <laughs> and their excuse was that she fell, the woman who fell, it was an elderly lady, the woman who fell fell in an unusual way and our catchers couldn't reach her on time. Your catchers? <laughs> you know, in, John, in Revelation chapter 1, I, I read that, that John heard behind him a voice as of a great trumpet and he said, I turned to look and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands and one uh, like the son of man in the midst and so forth and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead and I don't find John having to go to a chiropractor to work on his back after he fell or when Ezekiel saw this great thing in Ezekiel 1 the eyes and the wheel within a wheel whoo he fell down or when those men came in, in John 18 and said we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth Jesus said I am he they all went backwards and fell to the ground I don't find any catchers there. Now, if you wanted to catch somebody, that's fine. But nobody's going to break their back, though. Can you imagine? She broke her back. She broke her back and is paralyzed now. And they're suing him for half million. I thought half million, you know, that's nothing. Why not go for ten or something? 
Might as well go for a big amount if you're going to attack somebody like that. <laughs> well, I don't know how we got off on that, but... Um, well, I know how we got off on that. You got two meetings side by side. One who just teaches the word like the Apostle Paul would do. Didn't he come into, into the city of Ephesus in Acts 19? And there, two whole years in the school of Tyrannus, he taught the word so that all that are in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jew and Gentile. Now, I know that he worked a miracle or two also. Anointed claws went out from his body and demons were cast out and people were healed. But that was because of the authority of the word that was in the Apostle Paul's ministry. For two whole years, he preached the word in Ephesus, in the school of Tyrannus, so that all those in Asia, both Jew and Gentile, heard the word of the Lord Jesus. The authority of the word is going to bring the power to work these miracles and signs in. When Jesus is here and he's here, he's present through the word as it's proclaimed and ministered, then there's authority and there's power to heal. Well, I think that Brother Freeman certainly had a lot of insight here. That when you get a miracle worker together and a teacher together, you watch and see where the people go. And invariably, they follow the miracle worker. And so what's the end of this third point, this third reason that we're on here? Well, what often ends up happening is the devil entices, the people grow bored, and the minister then falls into the old snare of turning bread into stones. You say bread into stones, uh, don't you have that backwards, stones? No, I've got it right this time. The minister falls into the snare of turning bread, the word of God, into stones. Some carnal things, miracles or whatever. This is a little twist on Matthew 4, 3 and 4. Not turning stones into bread, turning bread into stones. He falls into that. The devil tempts the people. They start yawning, getting bored with the word. The minister picks up on those vibrations, knows that, hey, you know, my meal ticket's on the line here. I better do something about this. I better have a guest speaker, or I better find out what the new thing is out in charismatic land, and we'll bring that into our church and see if we can get everybody excited. Hey, listen, I, I'm not just talking off the top of my mouth or head. L listen, I brought something along. I'm not going to be specific, but here is a printed letter that I got from another place. And I just wanted to read one sentence out of it to you. These things stand out to me. It's two pages, I mean two full pages, just the front side. Something's going to happen. Somebody's going to have a meeting and something's going to happen there. And end of the second paragraph goes like this. Our sole purpose is to restore a new hope and zeal in all of the bodies that have been a part of this end time movement. Now, let's analyze that for a moment. What stood out to me was that word restore. Restore means someone's lost something. Oh, I haven't lost anything. What are you talking about? Restore a zeal? Restore a new hope? I've told you before, you see, the people are getting bored. That's because some other things are not happening the way that they should. The people are getting bored. The ministers pick up on that and they change the tune. Now that little doo -doo 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 that they played earlier, it's a different tune that they're playing to now. It's a different note that they're stepping to now. And I catch in on that with this word restore, to restore. I know there, there's one particular brother who's always talking about, oh, I know that we've gone through hard times, there's been a lot of discouragement and a lot of setbacks, but the Lord's just going to... Well, why, all the, why should you be discouraged as a believer? I don't have anything to be discouraged about. Restore a new hope and a zeal in all the bodies that have followed this end time word. I see a problem right there in that sentence. Restore a zeal. You're never supposed to lose your zeal. Now, if you ask me, well, what if you do? Isn't it all right to restore? Well, sure, it's all right to restore. But rather than just start restoring everything, let's go back and find out what went wrong then. If we don't find that out, then we're going to lose it again, have to restore it again with another charismatic tangent. What went wrong then? What do you mean restore? Hey, we've been going here in this body 10 years now. We're not restoring anything. We're just continuing to grow. It should be this way with all of us. We're not some different group of people. We're just ordinary, regular, every day, seven day a week, run-of-the-mill followers of the Lord Jesus. That's all we are. We stay with this word. 
no such thing as a special or elite group. It's just that we're normal and average and everybody else is somehow subpar. <laughs> That's just the way that it is in the Christian world out there. We're not a, a special class of super-duper Christians. We're just average Christians. I mean, how can you get better than what you're supposed to be? How can you get better than what you've been commanded to do? And it's going to take all of our time and effort and spiritual energy just to do what we've been asked to do. And Jesus said, whenever you've done that, then you say, I'm an unprofitable slave. I've just done whatever's commanded of me. Luke 17. Restore a new hope and zeal in the body. That troubles me, friends. That type of mentality troubles me. And I think what I'm trying to say through all of that is that it indicates somebody lost something earlier. I mean, I didn't say that's their own words. Restore, doesn't restore mean you had something, you lost it, now you're getting it back? All right, that, that's not my interpretation. What happened then? Now you're going to restore it? How are you going to restore it? Restore it by a special meeting, special minister, new tangent that you're on? Hey, get off that old horse. That's not going to work. Religious man's tried that for countless centuries. Got to think up something new to keep the people encouraged. If the word won't do it, you might as well just close it up and go home, quit playing church. Get off that old horse. That's just an old religious horse people get on. Guest speakers are miracle services are come and we're going to pray for the sick tonight. Come and you're going to get a touch from God or you come and I'm not, I won't keep you over 30 minutes and... Or come and I'll preach a message that inspires you. Get off that old horse. That's what Babylon, the religious system, is all about out there. Man, you can find dime a dozen some religious, pathetic, goofball work like that. Just look around you. You can find those works everywhere. There are a dime a dozen. That's why I'm going back to what I said earlier tonight, that what has made this walk, this movement, different, what is characteristic um, most thoroughly and deeply about us is our allegiance to the Word of God. For the continuation of this message, please turn the tape over. They've, they've done good about it. Evidently the ministers were still doing what Paul said, or their descendants, what Paul had said earlier, watch out for, because they tried those who were apostles and were not and found them to be liars. But Jesus said, you know, you've been pretty good, pretty orthodox in your doctrine, but you've lost your first love. It's wonderful to be orthodox in doctrine. It's terrible when you lose your zeal, though. You know what you turn into then? An old scholar. And I told you before, I'd rather be a salamander than a scholar. Oh, you're orthodox, you got all the right, I believe in the head covering, non-resistance, not voting, you know, total faith way, orthodox, but you lost your zeal. You lost your zeal for the word. I'm not going to say I'd rather have zeal than orthodoxy, I'd rather have them both. I'd rather be right in doctrine and be enthused about it. Workload is too heavy, listen, I'm a minister, you're not, so... You just have to bear up with me here for a minute. If you were a minister, you could begin to appreciate, we've got some brothers here who have taught the word and ministered. You, you would appreciate that it is work to have to work in the word all the time. Amen. And when you're not a traveling speaker and you can take your little sermon that you preach everywhere you go, it's called your candy stick sermon, and run in there and just thrill everybody so they just ooh and ah and women go and faint and pass out in the aisles and men slap you on the back and say, that's a wonderful word, brother. And you go back and check the offering and oh, it's just, a, just overflowing, just won't even fit in the box because those people are so excited and so happy. And it's just your own little group and you're just plowing the field, laboring there in the word. 
Hey. You know, I, I only minister four times a week around here. I've only done that for about ten years. I know what it's all about. There's work involved. You have to be called and anointed and gifted, and you have to have the zeal, and you have to stay with it. When every other minister is getting off on his little pink pony riding off into the sunset, you think you as a minister going to stay back in the study working on messages and working in the Word, praying over the Word, asking the Holy Spirit to help you and guide you and direct you? Most people aren't going to do that. Not when all your colleagues are riding off into the sunset. You're kind of stuck out there alone. And you kind of stand out like a sore thumb. My, my. It certainly does happen. If you've never been in word ministry, you can't really begin to appreciate what a tremendous burden it, it can become. I didn't say it has to become, but a tremendous burden it can become. Let me say it like this, as the years roll by. For a year or two, well, I, most of us are smart enough. We could just think up messages for a year or two. But once you get beyond that, what are you going to say then? Without repeating yourself and boring everybody to sleep. What are you going to say then? What are you going to say after six months? What you said the first six months? What are you going to say after a year? What you said the first year? What are you going to say after five years and after ten years? The Holy Spirit, he's infinite. He can always give you the word. Amen. You've got to be a workman in the word, though. You've got to stay with that word. I would guess that probably most of the ministers out there don't even have the teaching schedule that we have around. They don't have to. You don't, you don't have to follow anybody else. If you only teach one time a week or twice a month or four times bi-yearly or whatever it is, that people get all this spread out and I wonder, I thought that we were called as the Lord's ministers to be workmen in the Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 and I don't know that you're really working in the Word when you have to get a message or two per year or per six months or per three months. Well, probably a lay member could go about doing that. I know what it's all about, I believe. I, I know what it's about, I guess, as much as I can know, having been in an, as short a period as I have, not compared to Paul and all these other great ministers of old. But people can grow weary in the well-doing of the word. Uh, I guess even teaching uh, once or twice a week. So here's the situation. People grow tired of the word. Here's some reasons why this happens. I've just given you that. Now, here are some of the choices that the minister and the people are confronted with. And I'd like to conclude tonight's study with this. The situation is people grow weary in the well-doing of the word. The reason why is multi-reasons. I just gave you some of those. And you could perhaps think of some others yourself. What can we do about it? Well, number one, we can just stay with it anyway. Stay with what? Deep, regular, detailed, systematic study of the work. Now, I want to tell you something here, friends, from my own personal observations, and we have to be faithful with what we see. And, uh, I mean, that means if we think we see something, we think we see it. We can't be dishonest about it. I think what I see, I think what I have seen, I think what it should just be obvious. I think I can date where certain problems begin to creep into ministries and meetings, groups and churches. I think I can date that back to the time it worked for any church who's ever fallen into this. I think I can date that back to the time they got off, they stopped regular, deep, detailed, systematic study in the Word that kept people so enthused about their walk with Jesus. You know what? The devil is a liar and he's a deceiver. He tells you that if you'll seek a thrill, you're going to keep your people. You know what? You're going to lose your people and lose your own life too. He offers the world to you and says, take the world. You take the world, you lose your own soul. He says, it's going to be fun and, and, you know, the people are wanting this. And you know what? People are pretty fickle. You find this out when you stay around. People are pretty fickle. You think, they think, we all think they want something else and you give it to them. Well, they get tired of that after a while. So you go back to square one and say, 
hold on, time out, stop, let's just wait. If the word doesn't do it, I don't have any other suggestion or choice. So let's just stay with it then. Let's just give it an opportunity. Let's see what happens. Let's just stay with it. Stay with deep, regular, detailed, systematic study of the word. Now, see, I know what I'm talking about here. I've watched other groups whenever there was regular teaching that gave the people something to look forward to. They knew when they came to the body, when they came to the meeting, when they came to church, they were going to hear something new probably from the word by which they would grow. Desire the sincere milk of the word and thereby you can grow, Peter said. People are, if, if they have a true heart, a true meaning of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, a true work of the Holy Spirit done in their heart, the thing they want most of all is the Word of God. I just have that confidence in God's people that what they want most of all in their heart of hearts is the Word of God regular, detailed teaching where you know you're going to finish one area and you're not just going to say, well, now we're through. We've done all of our studies. You're just going to go into another area. And it goes back to an earlier reason I gave. Some people think they've studied all there is to study. You say, well, I can't even conceive how somebody could think that. Let, let me tell you, some people can think that. That's the mentality. That's the approach that they have. They don't see how much more there is in the Bible. They don't see. I mean, you could go back to some Old Testament book and start doing a study. Which of us in this building really knows all there is in the Old Testament? None of us know half of what's back there. We know a lot more about the new than the old. Get back into the middle of Isaiah somewhere. Find out what that middle chapter is talking about. You'll learn some things that you probably didn't know, and so would I. You'll find that throughout the Word of God. You don't graduate from God's school. So here's one choice. We stay with it. Here's another choice. Secondly, we stay with the word, now listen to this, but we change the approach. We stay with the word, that's kind of stay with the word all in quotes. We stay with the word, but we change the approach. Let me give you a couple of scenarios that can happen here. First of all, under this, more and more, the messages become repetitive of general themes that have already been heard and taught taught and heard, I guess I should say. More and more of the messages become repetitive. Now, there is a need for repetition. There's no question about that. It can easily be overdone, though. We don't have rules. We don't have even guidelines. How often should you preach on healing? How often should you preach on faith? How you should just do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. But what he's going to lead you to do is continue to go and search out new things in the word. The psalmist prayed, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. He's one who's knowledgeable in the world, who's, word, who's skilled with the word, so much so he's writing the word. And he said, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. There were things he had never seen in the word. Well, we're up. Uh, Hippopotamus, if we don't have that much spiritual common sense, there are things that we've never seen in the Word. We need teachers to come along and teach us those things. That'll bless our heart. It'll make us clean. Nobody knows all there is to know in this book. The only one who knows this is that spirit of the living God who searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. He knows all that's here. None of us do. Oh, we're wanting to know it all. We might kind of know the outline of it all, so you can say in principle, well, I know all that's there, but oh, there's so many nice little tricks and treats and twists and turns in this book that we've got to keep studying and studying and searching out. Well, I'm afraid I might become dry that way. No, I have never become dry that way. I've never become dry that way because it's a great, well, can I say thrill? It's just a thrill to get into God's Word and study these things. Better than honey in the honeycomb, this word. It's a priceless, precious, pure word. It costs the prophets and the apostles their life's blood. Hallelujah. So we're, yes, there is some need for repetition, but again, I'm looking back on various past events and people will stay with the word. They, they don't get off on some tangent uh, per se. They don't, they don't follow some... 
extension of charismania. They stay with the word, but they change the approach. They're not going from glory to glory, faith to faith, study to study, getting deeper in the word. The messages tend to become repetitive, just over and over and over and over. And I'm just saying, yes, we do need repetition. It can easily be overdone. And secondly, I'm, I'm still saying to this second point, here's another way by which one could stay with the word and yet change the approach. And that goes something like this. One real inviting attraction for the minister is what I call the weekly tailored message of popular appeal. I'm going to give you a little scenario and just watch how this could really break a minister's heart. You see that it's not the easiest thing in the world. That's why I said on some earlier messages, be patient with all of us who are in ministry. We're not God. We're not infallible. You have to be patient. It's not the easiest thing to do. You're teaching things, and obviously you're not God. I know that you're required to be blameless, but that's not sinless perfection. You're still learning things yourself. It's not the easiest thing to do to try to lead people when you're growing. But that's just, we're all growing, so that's just the way that it is. God just chooses to raise some people up and put them over others. That doesn't make them better than others. It just puts them in a ministry position over others, and they're there so they can, as Paul said, not have dominion over your faith, but be helpers of your joy. Now, let me draw a picture of what can happen, of what has happened. The inviting attraction of the weekly tailored message of popular appeal. Uh, obviously, what this is playing on is the carnal desire of the people to feel uplifted and inspired whenever they come to church. Minister might want to not be laying out heavy doctrine because people might not be inspired and uplifted, quote unquote, by that. Let's take a brother who teaches once or twice or 17 times a week, but let's just say once a week to make this situation nice and easy to remember and it will fit well. Let's say he teaches every Sunday morning, which would be an obvious time for a brother to teach. And so on Monday morning, then, his, after he taught on Sunday, on Monday morning, his work begins for the next Sunday's message. So he labors all week, assuming that he does that, I'm assuming that ministers are workmen in the Word. He delivers that. He's worked all week on that. Now, you think you go to work, and, and you get to do all this, and he's just laboring over that Word, and, and he's laboring over that Word, and all of it's for this one little, nice little hour time, his 60-minute slot of glory, and it's all over with. Now watch what can happen here. He delivers it. Oh, he feels good after it. He's worked all week. He shakes the people's hands. He goes home, and the grind starts all over again. No one's life was gloriously transformed. People were ministered to. Their heart was pricked. They appreciated the word. But I found that this growth, this, this walk is a growth. No person just said, oh, from here on out, I'll never be the same. No one is gloriously changed. You get little recognition for the teaching. Then you go back to your box of messages and you try to find, now what the Lord wants me to say next go around. And what I'm saying is that can simply wear a person out spiritually and mentally. That was up under the fourth reason the workload is just too heavy to maintain it's just too heavy to maintain when you think what a minister has to go through that that he works all week whenever whenever he's just gearing on that one message and if you don't watch out all of your hope is in that what this is going to be a wonderful message it's going to really speak to everybody and people politely shake your hand and say good word brother and then you go back home and the grind starts all over again. It's Monday morning again. That message is gone. Those people are going to be back again. <laughs> you know, it's like washing dishes for you sisters or changing diapers. They don't, that'll never stop. That's over and over and over and over. You either get your heart in it or you get your body out of the house and go do something else. That's over and over. You, you conquer it up here in your mind. You get your mind made up. I'm committed to this. I'm committed to this wall. It's until death of the rapture for me. Amen. What it was at Psalm 48, 14, when the psalmist said, and this God is our God forever and ever, and he is my guide even unto death. That's my confession. He's my guide unto death of the rapture. 
This God is my God forever and ever, and he is my Lord, Savior, my friend, and my guide unto death. I remember, friends, when I, back when I first got in the ministry, first year, first couple of months, I was preaching as many as 15 times a week, loved every minute of it. Preached so much, I didn't have time to take care of my body, and the devil hit me with a disease. And I had to overcome that and walk that out by faith. And then I learned that you, gotta, you can't just... I was just gone all the time. I mean, I was just preaching. I was preaching in a church, preaching in a school, preaching in full gospels, preaching in a home meeting, preaching out on a farm. They paid me with eggs and things out on the farm. You'd get in the car and look in the back seat and there'd be eggs and things like that. back. That was your offering from that group. They sat around the living room floor and I just stood in the middle of them and just turned around in a big circle and talked to all of them. That was a blessed meeting. Hey, guess what? That lasted for a while. They thought, this guy's new. We're going to have him in here and see what he has to say. And I just kept in the old grind, grinding away. Because I know that's how you're going to build something. You, know, you don't run out and just say, come on, come on, come on, come you down. Let's throw this building up here. It takes time to put a building up. You start flying around and pitching hammers and saws and throwing boards, and you're going to have just a big old mess on your hands when you get through it takes time. You've got to stay with it. It takes time to build, to build, to build this foundation, which is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3. Well, I, my heart goes out to ministers because my heart goes out to me because I'm one of them. But you know what, friends? Because we, the Lord has given us, by his grace, a certain conception of what this walk is all about that I don't feel like I have to come here and inspire you with a message. Whatever the Lord anoints. Last Wednesday night I had another word. I think it was this word right here that I was going to... And I stood over here and, and the Lord just... I want you to share on faith and, and bless the people tonight. And, and I stood up. I didn't have any notes. And what? We went about an hour and a half or two hours. And that really ministered to all of us. It ministered to me. You have to speak for yourself. It ministered to me. I was really blessed. I just went home on riding on air on the way home. I was so blessed by that. The Lord gave us that. But hey, we're also in systematic theology and the book of Revelation and this study and that study. And it gives you people, it gives you something to look forward to when you're coming here. Not a little inspirational thing that you feel so good that you get up the next morning and hey, you've got to go to work now. That little feeling that you had the night before, it may not be there now. But you know what? If you've got the word, it doesn't matter. If you've got the word, it doesn't matter. We walk, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, not by sight, by feelings. We walk by faith, Amen. not by sight. You know, I'm growing. Praise God. I'm, sometimes God does bless us with a, and when I say sometimes, I mean like all the time. He blessed us with a real encouraging word. It's either from me or, you know, I'm not the only speaker here. How about all the rest of you? Tongues, prophecies, interpretations, revelations, singing of songs. This is a church where we've got body ministry here. I can stand up and lecture on this little subject and you can have already been thoroughly blessed because the Lord spoke through a brother or sister out there in prophecy. That's what it's all about. The body has need, every member has need of one another so we're fitly joined together and we make increase of ourselves in love, Paul said. Hallelujah. Well, you see, that... that Weekly tailored message of popular appeal, that, that does have a lot of appeal. That you work real hard and you just... But I'll, I'll tell you what, though. Th that type of practice can have its own peculiar problems. Let me mention a, those first, a few of those. First of all, it can show that perhaps one has already fallen, fallen into the hands of the people who want to be inspired each time they come with something real personal, with something very relevant to their life and to their needs. People want a fresh word. A fresh word is good. A fresh word, quote, unquote. You know what I mean by that? I mean just something that just makes us all so happy and thrilled that we just go out here excited. A fresh word is good, but you can overdo a fresh word. I mean, if you can preach a fresh word until it's just... Freshness is coming out your ears. You're not necessarily going deeper in the Word of God. You're feeling inspired. You're feeling good. You're not necessarily going deeper in the Word of God, though. I want to know more about the Bible. You know, I want to know what Genesis 1 says, and 2, and, and Exodus, and Leviticus 1, and Numbers 1. I want to know what the Bible says. I believe that Paul knew what this book taught. I believe Jesus knew what this book taught when he was on the earth. 
I believe the early church was instructed in this word. I believe that's what we should want as well. Amen. Another problem with this weakly tailored message of popular appeal is it may be too nearsighted. I mean, you can get to the place you're overly contemporary. You don't have time to stand back from it and really absorb its depth. It can't really serve as a building block for the larger building. It's quickly forgotten because it may spring forth too much from that week's events instead of eternal truth and reality in the Word of God. I, I've had people ask me, how do you get your messages together? And I don't tell people because there's not much to tell because it's just a whole variety of ways. Sometimes the messages, like when we study New Testament intro, which was a very blessed study, that wasn't just like a technical thing we were ministered to. Those messages were done five, six years ago, worked up and done and ready so that we could minister them. Say, well, you know, that's not depending on the Holy Spirit. And Well, if you work yours up on Monday and you don't have to preach it until the next Sunday, then what's the difference in me working mine up 74 Mondays ago it's the same thing. If you're going to come down to what I think a person is after right there, then the only way you could ever teach is just stand up behind the pulpit and open your mouth wide and expect God to fill it. And sometimes he will with hot air. You've got to be a workman in the worst. You've got something worth saying to God's people. But I just told you another type of message, you know, we preach, we, we stand up here and God does fill our mouth with something to say. Sometimes they're prepared, sometimes they're changed or switched around. You know, I, I couldn't tell you. It's just a whole variety of ways. But you don't want to be so nearsighted and overly contemporary, and you know, because you're going to probably work into that week's message, everything that's going on around you that week, and it may lose sight of, you know, of, of the long-range goals and consequences. You did something, you worked it up several years ago, now it's time to minister it, and you say, hmm, was I so smart back then after all? You've got a couple of years of growth now before you ever stand up and say what you thought the Lord was going to have you say when you worked on that several years ago. So it's a whole variety of ways. Now, I want to conclude then, believe it or not, with one final alternative that people are confronted with. We said, number one, you could stay with it. Number two, you could stay with the word but change the approach. And some have done that. And number three, and here's really a dangerous one, you can look for other areas of attraction. You can look for other areas of attraction. What do I mean there? Tangents that are extensions of charismania. We'll be talking about some of these more later on. Prophecy, deliverance. You see, it's not that these things are unbiblical or not scriptural, but people do get off on tangents. So, If the minister, if the ministry, if the church, if the people stay in the word, they're going to be safe. You're going to be safe if you stay in the word. I'm just, I can't help but be, this is the way I've been trained, and I just don't plan on changing. If anybody's going to change, it's going to have to be somebody else, not going to be me. Because I know the fruit this type of approach has brought to me and has brought to this body over these years. It has brought some strength and some stability to us, some knowledge of the word, and a lot of joy and victory along with that. How many wonderful things have we seen in this body? And, and then you can... Uh, cross those out for a moment. You know, the external, the healings, and all these, all these blessed children that have been born by the Lord's power, I mean, by His protection. You can mark all that out and then go back to what's maybe even more important, those struggles that people have in their own mind. Now, am I really right? Or is He right? Who's right here? That's a fearful thing to ever fall into, that, that second-guessing and wondering. And the only reason you do that is you're not grounded in the Word. If you do that, you're not grounded in the Word. If you're in the Word, you're safe. Doesn't mean your positions can't be challenged and you can't listen. But uh, if your positions are right and they're challenged and you listen, you'll just grow deeper in that area. There's nothing to be afraid of. So what are some other areas? Well, miracle sideshows. Friends, why? Why are we who are in this overcomers camp, why are we having to talk about this? We were warned and warned and warned over the years. 
Watch out. Don't follow the miracles and the signs. Sign seekers, Brother Freeman had a tape entitled, Sign Seekers, Denominational Doubters and Charismatic Skeptics. Sign seekers, people seeking signs. You watch whenever a meeting starts getting bigger, that just, you know, it, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It grows by growth. People think, oh, wow, something's really going on there. They're getting bigger in number. Man, I'm going to get down there in a hurry. And people run to whatever meeting is getting bigger and bigger. Must be big things happening there. I thought we were worn and worn and wondered, get off of that old horse of the adding machine mentality that you equate God's blessing with numbers. Get off that old denominational horse. That's not in the word of God. That proof of his blessing is in numbers. I mean, if somebody believes that in this walk, I, if you really believe that, get up, just get out of here. We don't even need anybody around like that. We were warned and warned and warned against that. Your, your proof, the proof of everything is in the Word. It's not in numbers. It's not in all that external stuff. And then you always have to add a parenthesis and say, praise God, when you've got numbers and the dead are being raised left and right and you're, the children are raising the dead. Praise God when you've got that. But what do you do when you don't? 